these are the questions you and I have to ask. How did we get this money? Hope that production limits. Helping to drive down the price of oil from $20.50 a barrel in the opening days of 1990 to a mere $13.60 a barrel by some people. We didn't come over on the Nita, the Pinta, and the, and, the, and the whatchamacallit. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Landed right on top of us. We're down crack. Why? You can get all the film and the footage of all the carnage in Los Angeles, but you can show me no footage of any damage in, in Iraq. And all you show me is some surgical strike. Now, one year later, it comes out that these so-called surgical strikes will make sense. August 2, 1990, Saddam Hussein's forces crash through the defenses of oil-rich Kuwait. In fear of an Iraqi invasion into Saudi Arabia, the United States and her coalition allies poured into the Arabian Peninsula to form a deterrent, a deterrent that would be known as Desert Shield. The result was a series of diplomatic talks, negotiations and counter-negotiations that rapidly declined into a no-hope situation. On August 17, 1991, Desert Shield became Desert Storm. This one comet. Clearly I've never been there, but it feels like we're in the center of hell. There's a thing to do these flashes of light, Austin. Whoa, holy cow. The conflict was witnessed by millions through the eye of CNN and the BBC, showing a propaganda of the systematic eradication of Saddam's forces by a coalition far superior in technological, political, and economic power. However, what was little known was that from the outset the war was engineered, controlled, and manipulated by an elite group. A group which had created the illusion of a man with power, at the head of a million-strong army, on the verge of going nuclear. A man who had gained control over one-fifth of the world's oil overnight. However, in reality, he was merely a pawn, in amongst many pawns. Just a puppet in a grand master plan, with the Gulf War as a well-orchestrated stepping stone. The orchestrators of the war were by no means strangers to controlling major world events. In fact, they have done so for centuries. From the shadows, they have engineered every major war, revolution and recession. They control everything you read, everything you hear and everything you see. They have managed to indoctrinate an entire populace to their way of thinking and have infiltrated key positions in places of authority. And it is from the shadows that they have created a new political order a new economic order and more sinister, a new religious order. Their ultimate aim is total global domination and they will stop at nothing to reach their goal. The goal that was outlined in a speech given by former President of the United States, George Bush. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. However, the origins of this global plan were not created in the offices of the White House. In reality, their roots lay in another war. This time, the year is 1095, and the place, Clermont, France. Eleventh century Europe was ruled by the church which held a firm grip on the hearts and minds of the people. This power enabled Pope Urban II to wage war on the Muslim Caliphate and Crusade in what he called a War of the Cross, to recapture the land of Jerusalem. It had been under Muslim rule since the year 637, but in 1099, this rule was brought to a bloody and sudden end. In the name of the cross, women were raped and murdered, children were put to the sword, and it is said that blood ran in the streets knee-high to the horses. 
Out of this land of bloodshed and terror, a group of men arose. Men that would stop at nothing to get what they wanted, no matter what the cost. Twenty years after Jerusalem was taken, the Dome of the Rock was seized by a group of warrior monks calling themselves the Knights of the Temple of Solomon, or more simply, the Knights Templars. In Jerusalem, the Templars began to deviate further and further away from the practices of Christianity. They learned the secret arts of the Kabbalah, an ancient form of Jewish magic, along with its dark rites and rituals. The Jews had learned the arts from the pagans of ancient Egypt during the times of enslavement to the Pharaoh and developed them into Babylon at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. In 1307, King Philippe of France arrested them for charges of denial of Christ, homosexuality and idol worship as well as magic. In 1314, Pope Clement V declared all Templars as heretics to Christianity, ordering all their properties to be seized. Their leader, Jacques de Morlaix, was captured and burnt to the stake. The Templars were cornered, and just when it seemed they were finished forever, a glimmer of hope arose from a seemingly certain end. They were to find a safe haven as well as an ally. But not in France. In fact, in a country in a desperate struggle for independence against the English. The country of Scotland. For some, Scotland's hope of independence had died with the death of William Wallace. However, to the King of Scotland, Robert the Bruce, the arrival of the Templars gave him a new secret weapon. Their experience, gained over 200 years of fighting the mighty armies of Islam, had made them expert in combat and warfare, and more than a match for any army brought before them. In 1314, the Templars, allied with Robert the Bruce and his army, took to the fields of Bannockburn in a long-awaited showdown with the English. Robert the Bruce's foresight paid off. The 25,000 strong English army suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of only 6,500 men. The dream of an independent Scotland had finally been achieved. The Templars had brought themselves back from the brink of destruction and never again would they allow themselves to be destroyed. This time they would control the country by controlling its kings. And in order to preserve their secret order, the Templars would have to die or more precisely, the name would have to die. The Templars, who had escaped Europe, were finally laid to rest in Rosalind Chapel, Scotland, which stands to this day as sign of their presence in Britain. Their descendants became the true power of Scotland. In 1603, the death of Queen Elizabeth I left England without an heir to the throne. By virtue of descent, King James V of Scotland became King of England. In doing so, Scotland and England joined to form a new kingdom, and the power that the Templars held over Scotland spread to give them a firm grip on the whole of Great Britain. For over a hundred years, the Templars concealed their activities, fading into the background until they were little known and little remembered. However, they did not cease to keep a firm grip on Britain. All the time they were planning, regrouping, and infiltrating positions of power in all corners of the kingdom. In 1717, the Templars made their reappearance in Europe. They had grown in both number and strength, and were now ready to coin a new identity, free from their reputation of the past, and given credibility by none other than the monarchy and aristocracy of England. And the name they chose for themselves was a name that would be known by many, but understood by a few. This new name, the Freemasonry. The new identity and the grandeur of its members afforded the Masons with respect and dignity. The first royal member of the Freemasons was Frederick, Prince of Wales. The latest members include Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and consort to the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II, who herself is a grand patron to the Masons. However, behind closed doors, the Freemasons were free to indulge in the secret rites and rituals handed down to them by their ancestors. And these became the basis of their levels of membership, called degrees. Degree, degree. The Freemasons were not content with power in Britain alone. Their ambitions were far greater. In the years to come, the world would witness Europe and America being plagued by wars and revolutions, each more devastating than the other. However, these would not be as commonly believed the spontaneous effects of a downtrodden people, but in fact schemes created by the exclusive feud driven by hunger for absolute power. All this would take place from the very country from which they had fled centuries earlier, and would come to the base 